All right, hi everyone. This is the introduction to ophthalmology. So you're going to have one week on ophthalmology before you get into your neurology unit. And so we really have a very quick time to learn about quite a lot of pathology. We wanna start by introducing you to the basic structures of the eye, discussing the function of the eye and reminding you of the pathway of visual processing in the central nervous system. We're going to then apply the function of the eye to common physical exam procedures, including cranial nerve testing, pupillary light reflexes, accommodation reflex, and the visual acuity testing. And we're going to outline the basic pathophysiology of the eye. Just a quick introduction because you're going to take a deep dive into each of the major conditions affecting the eye with each of the lectures as we go through this unit. So ophthalmology is the study of the anatomy, physiology, and diseases of the eye. 285 million people worldwide are visually impaired. 39 million are blind, and 246 million have lower impaired vision. This is from the World Health Organization. 937,000 Americans over the age of 40 are blind, and 2.4 million Americans have low vision. 90% live in underdeveloped countries, so a visual impairment, um, visual impairment is high in underdeveloped countries. 65% of individuals with visual impairment are age 50 and older. This includes uncorrected refracted areas, cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration. These are the most common causes, and you will learn more about these as we go through. So let's start with the anatomy of the eye. Generally, I'm going to give you this overview and then we'll go into each of these specifically. So the eye is a special sensory organ that processes light. It is housed in the orbit of the skull and it is moved by the extraocular muscles. It's composed of three layers, which we'll go through in detail as we draw the eye. It's also protected by external accessory structures and glands. We'll then get into the pathology of the eye, which includes infection and inflammatory conditions and structural and disease-related changes. It's really helpful to separate the external structures from the internal structures, just in terms of the way that we're organizing this lecture. But please keep in mind that pathology can be broad and the causes can be systemic. For example, many autoimmune conditions affect the eye. And infections can also spread. So where it may affect one structure, it can then spread to more broadly affect the entire eye. Let's start with the orbit. So the orbit is formed by um, cranial and facial bones. 80% of the eyeball is receded into the orbit. The orbit contains and protects the eyeball, the muscles attached to the eyeball, the nerves, vessels, and the lacrimal apparatus, which is producing the secretions of the eye, particularly the tears. The portion of the orbit that is not occupied by the eyeball is mainly filled by orbital fat. This is important to consider, first of all, for orbital fractures. So with a large blow to the eye, directly to the eye, the margins of the eye formed by, primarily by the frontal, zygomatic, and maxillary bones, the margins of the eye are generally intact. But the medial wall towards the nose and the inferior wall of the eye or the floor, uh, excuse me, the, the medial wall of the orbit or the inferior wall of the orbit are thin. And those are more subject to fracture. A medial wall fracture usually affects the ethmoid and the sphenoid bone, and they're color-coded here, and here's the color coding for that. So the ethmoid bone is just peeking through here in orange. If you looked in towards the medial wall, you'd see a little bit more of it, and the sphenoid bone here is, is just in the back of the eye, and then forming the medial, medial wall here next to the ethmoid bone. An inferior wall fracture will affect possibly the maxillary sinus, which is just inside the maxillary bone. It can also entrap the muscle that is underneath the inferior portion of the eyeball, which is the inferior rectus, and cause entrapment of that muscle. 
If there is a change in the fat content or if there's a tumor or swelling in the fat surrounding the eye, you can get bulging of the eyeball and that's exophthalmos. That's an anterior protrusion of the eye from the orbit from its normal position. Conversely, if you have a low fat content or you reduce the fluid, you can, you can have the eyeball recess into the orbit and then you'll have posterior displacement. So the orbit is an important part of your physical examination of the eye, looking at the bones and also the position of the eyeball within the orbit. Surrounding the eye and moving the eye are the extrinsic muscles of the eye, which are going to originate on the bones of the orbit and then attach directly to different portions of the eye. These are controlled by cranial nerve 3, 4, and 6. And I know you guys are very good at your cranial nerve testing by now, so this should be a bit of a review for you. I've listed each of the muscles here. I'm not going to read these to you. If you need a reminder of what each of these muscles do, um, take a minute to pause and read through here. But I'll just point out that they are generally named for where they are located. So the superior rectus is on the superior portion of the eyeball and it is a straight, rectus means straight, it is a straight muscle with relation to where it's located. It goes straight back to the orbit. The inferior oblique is underneath, attached to the under portion of the eyeball and it moves in an oblique direction towards the orbit. Here's a nice summary diagram from the Moore textbook which shows which muscles are being tested by which ocular movements. So for example, if you move your eyes to the left, you'll be using your left lateral rectus and your right medial rectus. And in some cases, you will combine muscles for particular movements. I also like this diagram because it color codes based on the cranial nerves. So those in orange are controlled by the oculomotor nerve, those in purple are controlled by the trochlear nerve, and those in green are controlled by the abducent nerve. So as you're testing the different positions of gaze, for your patient, you can look at this diagram and review which cranial nerves are you testing as you go through that. So this leads in then to the nerves of the orbit. So we just covered the cranial nerves that are for motor movement of the eye muscles, that's three, four, and six. We also have some sensory and sensory motor combined nerves. The optic nerve is cranial nerve two, and that's taking the information from the photoreceptors and bringing those electrical signals into the brain. The trigeminal nerve is cranial nerve five, and it has several branches which will go into the eye. Cranial nerve five one is the ophthalmic nerve, and it has all of these small branches which will then go to different portions of the, the eye and the nasal cavity. There's also the ciliary ganglion, which is a complex set of parasympathetic input. So the nerves are important to understand when we think about patients who may have either muscle or nerve damage. Here's an example of oculomotor nerve palsy, where the patient in a resting position has ptosis or drooping eyelid, a dilated pupil because the dilator pupillae is active and unopposed, and an abducted or an eye that is moving outward because the lateral rectus is active and unopposed. And it's also depressed or moving downward because the superior oblique is active and unopposed as cranial nerve 3 and the muscles controlled by cranial nerve 3 are not working. This patient has a specific paralysis of cranial nerve 6 and that only affects the abducent nerve. And so in the resting position, her eye is adducted because the medial rectus is active and unopposed as the lateral rectus is not working properly. It's important to also think about the blood supply to and from the eye. 
in particular when we're looking at something like pressures within the eye. We have an arterial blood supply that can be both to the retina through the retinal arteries and to different portions of the eye, eye and eye muscles. This comes ultimately from the internal carotid artery, which then branches to the ophthalmic artery. There's drainage from the eye, which ultimately ends in the cavernous sinus, the pterygoid plexus, and the facial vein. And there are small branches which will lead into those drainage structures. A really important note to understand about the vasculature of the eye and the orbit is that the cornea and the lens of the eye do not have blood vessels. They are avascular. So instead, they are bathed in aqueous humor. And that is what provides nutrients to the cornea and the lens. That aqueous humor still has to drain out and be recycled. So it's being produced and recycled. And it drains out through this um, structure we used to call the Canal of Schlem, which is a great name and I keep using it. But we're trying to move away from these names. Um, and this is called the scleral venous sinus. And I'll show you that when we draw out the eye. The balance between production and outflow of aqueous humor is, the, is what forms intraocular pressure. So if you either have too much aqueous humor being produced, or more commonly, you have a blockage in the canal of Schlem and you don't have drainage, you can get high intraocular pressure values. Let's pause for a moment now to draw the anatomy of the eye. Get out a piece of paper and I'm going to draw with you and we're going to do the three layers of the eye and some of the major structures of the eye. I'm also including this very detailed diagram because we don't have time to go into every single structure, but you have it referenced here if something comes up. So starting with the outer layer of the eye. The outer layer is the fibrous layer and it's made up of the white of the eye, which is the sclera. So the sclera is this outer portion here, all on the outside of the eyeball, and that's where the extraocular muscles are going to attach as well. In the front of the eye, continuous with the sclera, is the cornea. Now the cornea has to be clear so that the light can pass through. Next, if we're going from outside to inside the eye, is the choroid or the vascular layer. So here you can see all of these blood vessels running through that vascular layer. Remember that those blood vessels don't pass over to the cornea and the lens. You'll see that here. There are two major chambers of the eye. The anterior chamber, which is in front of the lens, and the posterior chamber, which is behind the lens. The anterior chamber contains the aqueous humor. The posterior chamber contains the vitreous humor, which is a jelly-like substance that actually holds the lens and forms more structure to the back of the eye. The ciliary body is here to the side of the lens and it is made up of muscles that can move the lens. Then here is the lens. In front of the lens, there is a space. That space is a pupil. So the pupil allows the light through the cornea, through the pupil, and into the lens. Surrounding the pupil is a set of muscles that makes up the iris. Those are the dilator and sphincter muscles, which can help to dilate or contract the pupil. In the innermost portion of the eye, not including the vitreous humor, the innermost portion of the eye, which is color-coded here in yellow, we have the neural layer. The neural layer is a very thin layer that is composed of the photoreceptors that are going to be sensitive to the light as the light enters the eye. That portion that has the photoreceptors is the retina. The retina has a central 
collection of photoreceptors, which is the macula. And at the center of the macula is the fovea. This is the most sensitive portion of the eye to light. And so that is where we're going to have the most visual acuity, is when the light is focused on the fovea. There's also an area of the back of the eye where the optic nerve exits. So the electrical activity will be transformed by light and that electrical activity will then travel through cranial nerve 2, which is the optic nerve, and that's here in yellow, exiting the back of the eye. That space where it exits does not have photoreceptors, and so that is what we would call the optic disc, and that's a blind spot of the eye. You'll also notice that there are arteries, there is an artery and vein, the retinal artery and the retinal vein, which go through the optic disc. Okay, this is the external structures of the eye, and here's a side view if that helps you with your eye anatomy as well. The accessory structures are surrounding the eye. So they're going to prevent foreign objects from entering the eye. They're going to cover, clean, and lubricate the surface of the eye. So we start on the very external where we have the eyebrows and the eyelashes, and they help to filter dust and particles. We also then have the eyelids, and that is a very thin layer of skin that is covering the eye. On the, white of, on the surface of the eye, we have conjunctiva, and that's a mucous membrane that covers the eye surface. There's also a conjunctiva on the inner eyelid. They're both vascular. So the ocular conjunctiva is right on the surface of the white of the eye, so on the sclera, and the palpebral conjunctiva is on the inside of the eyelid. And we'll talk about inflammation of the conjunctiva, which is conjunctivitis. Here shown in blue is the internal structure, which would be behind the skin and nestled within the bones here of the orbit. So here we have the lacrimal apparatus, which is formed by the lacrimal gland that produces tears. That's one of the secretions of the eye. That's this watery secretion and the tears will flow over the eye and then be collected in the lacrimal sac. In order to be collected into the lacrimal sac, they will enter into these tiny little holes, which are the lacrimal puncta. In patients that have chronic dry eye, it's possible to block the lacrimal puncta, and then the tears will stay on the eye much longer. Of course, the side effect of that is then often they will look like they're crying all the time because they'll have tears running down their face more often than they would if the tear ducts were not blocked. So we have lots of secretions from the eyes, not just the watery secretions from the lacrimal gland. That would be the tears. Those secretions from the lacrimal gland can clear and rinse the surface of the eye. They also contain lysozyme to prevent bacteria from growing. But we have some other oily and gritty secretions that are important as well. So the meibomian or tarsal glands produce a thin oil through multiple ducts inside the eyelid, and those are shown here. This maintains a protective layer over the eye and keeps the eyelids from sticking together. Often you can recommend that patients don't just use artificial tears, but if they're having chronic dry eye, they can also look for um, eye drops that contain a more oily substance, and that will stay longer on the eye and be more beneficial. I'm sure your ophthalmologist will talk to you about that. We also have the moles glands and the glands of Zeiss. The moles glands are especially active at night and they're responsible for, this is a technical term, eye boogers. So those little eye boogers that you wake up with in the morning are from that gritty lipid that's produced by the moles glands. So at, they're at the margin of the eyelid and they're especially active at night preventing bacterial growth and pathogen entry. So a patient with an infection may have a, a highly increased amount um, of this gritty lipid being produced as a result of that. There's also glands of Zeiss, which helps to put oil onto the eyelashes and lubricate the eyelashes.
So we can have infection or inflammation of the external eye. Some of the conditions on your list, and these can be very common, um, are, are listed here. This is where the external structures become infected or inflamed due to particles, bacteria, or viruses. This can often be caused by poor, eye, poor hygiene, allergy, or pathogenic infection. So inflammation of the eyelids is blepharitis. You can also get cellulitis just like you can on any area of the skin. Bacterial infection of the eyelash root is a hordeolum or a sty. A blocked meibomian gland is a chalazion and may need surgical removal, and that's pictured here. Viral or bacterial infection of the conjunctiva is very common, especially in children. I know all, both of my kids have had this. This is pink eye, and here you can see an image of pink eye, and it's extremely contagious. Bacterial infection can also um, block the nasolacrimal duct, and that's dacrocystitis. You can then have structural changes to the external eye. If you have displacement of the eyelid, it can either be turned inward, that's entropion, or turned outward, that's ectropion. We already covered this with the orbit, but I'm listing it here because it's helpful. Exophthalmos is bulging. This is really common in hyperthyroidism where the fat pad behind the eye um, becomes larger. And here's an image of that. N ophthalmos is recession. This is common um, with something called Horner sy syndrome, that's sympathetic trunk damage, collapse of the sinuses. It can also be congenital or due to trauma. You can also have growth on the conjunctiva. This is a pinguecula, which you can see here, and a pterygium, shown here. They're benign, and they're possibly caused by UV light exposure. Okay, let's get a little bit more into the function of the eye. So vision is the sensation that detects patterns of light in the environment around us. And the basic summary of vision is that light enters the eye and stimulates the retina. The retina then converts those light signals into electrical signals, which will then travel through cranial nerve 2. Some of those will stay on the same side, and some of them will cross over at the optic chiasm, eventually reaching different portions of the brain and terminating um, in the occipital lobe of the brain at the primary visual cortex. So light is going to travel through the cornea, through the anterior chamber, which is filled with aqueous humor, through the pupil, which is the space in the iris, and then through the lens, the lens will bend the light and focus that light onto the retina in the back of the eye. The intrinsic eye muscles help to change the amount of light that is coming into the eye, and they also um, help to change the, the position of the lens, which can help to focus the light on the retina. So the ciliary body will bend to focus light, will bend the lens to focus light on the retina. A, a lens that has, that has no muscle tension will be round and bulged. A lens that is pulled by the ciliary, ciliary muscles will be flattened, and that's for distance vision. Near vision will be more bulged. Distance vision will be more flattened. One note here that I wanted to show you while we have this image up is that right near the ciliary body, right near the ciliary muscles, is the canal of Schlem. And that's where that aqueous humor will be draining to be removed out of the venous plexus of the eye. This will regulate intraocular pressure. And if it's blocked, aqueous fluid will accumulate. The muscle that surrounds the pupil is the iris. And the, the pupil is the space in the middle of the iris. So the iris is the colored portion of the eye. So whether you have green or blue or brown eyes, that's the iris. Dilation will allow more light in. And that's good for distance vision when you're looking at something really far away. But when you look at something close up, then the pupil needs to constrict in order to reduce the light coming into the eye. And that's for near vision. So you're going to activate the pupil when you take your light and you shine it into a patient's eye. And you should then see a difference between pupil dilation and pupil constriction based on how much light is shined in the eye. 
So there are many causes and ways to alter pupil dilation, not just light. But you should know by now, you guys have done this so many times already, that bright light contracts the iris. It can specifically contracts the sphincter pupillae. That's typically um, parasympathetic innervation with constriction of the eye. Dilation of the eye will happen in low light, and that's the dilator pupillae muscle of the iris. And that will also happen with sympathetic innervation. So meiosis is a constricted pupil that happens in bright light. That's because of the input from the parasympathetic nervous system. And anything that activates the parasympathetic nervous system as well will also cause, cause a constricted pupil. Opioids, for example, morphine, heroin, will cause constriction of the pupil. Medriasis is a dilated pupil. This happens in low light as a result of sympathetic nervous system input. Compression of cranial nerve 3 can also cause a dilated pupil, and that's because of rapidly rising intracranial pressure. There are other drugs that can affect um, the pupil and cause dilation. For example, anticholinergics, SSRIs, norepinephrine, different stimulants, and withdrawal from opioids. We use the pupillary light reflex to test the cranial nerve 2 function, but also the motor portion, cranial nerve 3, to the iris. So the sensory portion would be cranial nerve 2, did the light reach the brain? And the motor portion would be, did the brain talk to the extraocular muscles? So that would be cranial nerve 3. This is a consensual response, meaning that you only have to shine light in one eye to get both eyes to respond, and it should be consensual. So you will test both eyes if you're concerned about something wrong in this pathway to see where the defect may occur. So when you shine light into one eye, the response should be pupil constriction on both eyes. The same eye with the light shined into it is the direct light reaction, and the consensual light reaction is the opposite eye, and that should also constrict. So the retina is located on the back of the eye and contains the photoreceptors. We can view the retina through an ophthalmoscope. The back of the eye is the fundus. That's the inner surface of the posterior eye where the retina is located. So when you're looking through your ophthalmoscope, you're viewing the fundus, which includes the retina, and the blood vessels, which supply the retina. The retina contains rods for low light or night vision. They're black and white only vision. The, it also contains cones for bright light or color vision. The macula lutea is a more yellow looking portion of the fundus and of the retina, and it contains a high population of photoreceptors. The fovea is the center of the macula lutea, which is the highest concentration of photoreceptors. Near that, you will see the optic disc, where the optic nerve exits, and where the retinal vessels travel through the optic nerve to enter into the eye and where they leave the eye to drain. So from the retina, the axons will travel through the optic nerves, where some fibers will cross to the opposite side through the optic chiasm. The optic tracts are once you're in the brain. So it's a nerve when it's in the periphery, it's a tract when it's in the brain. These, of course, are continuous, though. They just have different names. And then it will travel through the optic tract to the thalamus and then to different regions of the cortex, ultimately to the visual cortex of the cerebral hemispheres, which is in the occipital lobe. Information will also be sent to the pineal gland for melatonin production and to the superior colliculus for visual reflexes. One of the most difficult concepts in ophthalmology is processing of the visual fields. So let's take a moment to review that. So the visual field is processed contralaterally. What that means is that the left visual field is processed in the right side of the brain. And you can see that here color-coded in red. So if we just look at the left eye, for the left eye, the left visual field is processed in the nasal portion of the left retina. 
For the right eye, the left visual field is processed on the temporal portion of the right eye. Because the left needs to cross over to be processed on the right side of the brain, the input from the left visual field from the nasal portion of the left eye is going to cross over the optic chiasm and join the input from the temporal portion, left visual field, of the right eye. So the left visual field information will be processed by the nasal portion of the left eye and the temporal portion of the right eye. Nasal portion crosses over, temporal portion stays, and all of that input will then go from the thalamus through the cerebral cortex, different parts of the cerebral cortex, and then be represented in the primary visual cortex in the back of the brain. So left visual field to right primary visual cortex. We could do the same thing for the right visual field. Well, you'll notice that the nasal portion of the right eye, that input will cross over and the temporal portion of the left eye will stay. So nasal crosses, temporal stays, and the entire right visual field will then be represented as it travels through to the left side of the brain. There are common visual defects. I want you to pause for a moment and read through these, but I'll talk them through as well. Defects that partially affect the retina can lead to black spots in the visual field. These are called scotomas. These are common in diabetic retinopathy, um, with infarcts, with degenerative diseases. So those are diagrammed here. So these are just portions of the retina that have been damaged, and the patient will see spots. Damage to the optic nerve will cause loss of all vision from one eye. This can be caused by optic neuritis. It's an early sign of MS, glaucoma, tumors, or trauma. Damage to the optic, optic chiasm we discussed in the endocrine portion this year, and this is common from a pituitary tumor that presses on the optic nerve. This will lead to a patient telling you that they have tunnel vision or loss of temporal visual fields from both eyes. An occipital lobe lesion will be half of the visual field from each eye. So if it's the left optic if, if it's the left occipital lobe, then we'll get the right visual field. If it's the right occipital lobe, it'll be the left visual field, and it's going to be a quadrant quadrantinopia, or just one quarter of the visual field. These are common with vascular causes, tumors, infections, or trauma. Visual acuity is the amount of vision that we are able to process. Impaired vision can be either distance or near vision. So myopia is impaired distance vision, and that's also termed nearsightedness. So if you can't see far away, you're sighted nearby. This can be caused by an elongated eyeball, and it's treated with a concave lens. Hyperopia is impaired near vision or farsightedness. So you have dif difficulty seeing things up close, but you can see far away. This can be caused by a short eyeball and it's treated with convex lenses. Presbyopia is similar, but it's used as a term specifically to talk about the visual acuity decline with aging, and that's near vision decline with aging. The accommodation reflex is also called the near reaction, and this occurs when you shift from distance vision to near vision. There are three things that happen during the accommodation reflex. Pupils will constrict to reduce the light coming in. The eyes will converge and move closer together. That uses the medial rectus of both eyes. And the ciliary muscles will contract to adjust the lens shape to be more convex. All of that is cranial nerve three. I'm leaving some images here for you to help you go through the anatomy. We're now going to switch to some of the pathology. So infection or inflammation of the eye. End ophthalmitis is infection or inflammation of the inner eye, and this can be caused by pathogens, autoimmune or inflammatory disorders, and eye injury. We can have inflammation of the cornea or nearby structures. 
Keratitis is also called carado conjunctivitis, and these can be caused by herpes simplex virus, other viruses, bacteria, fungi, parasites. Carado conjunctivitis sica, sica means drying out, is typically related to autoimmune medications or cranial nerve damage related to a decrease in tear production. Inflammation of the sclera or the white of the eye can be due commonly to autoimmune conditions. This can cause severe eye pain and can radiate to the forehead and the jaw. This is scleritis. Inflammation of the iris, ciliary body, or choroid can also be due to immune auto in, um, immune, autoimmune infection or injury. This is called uveitis. If it's anterior, it's iris only. If it's intermediate, it affects the vitreous humor. And if it's posterior, it includes the choroid and the retina. This can be acute or chronic. And here's a visual of acute anterior uveitis. Corneal abrasions or damage to the lens are also common. So these are eye injuries that can cause structural impairment of the eye. These can be severe and they can lead to blindness. Damage to the cornea by physical or chemical trauma is a corneal abrasion and you'll need a topical antibiotic to prevent infection. Corneal abrasion, as I said, can be extremely painful and disruptive. Damage to the lens is a cataract. This is not painful, but it, it will cause difficulty with vision. This is a thickened lens associated typically with age, but also smoking, diabetes, and long-term steroid use. Pathology of the eye related to the retina. You can have detachment of the retina. This can be caused by trauma, pressure, post-cataract surgery, or genetic differences. Macular degeneration affects the macula, which is that central high, high um, concentration of photoreceptors for color vision. This deteriorates with aging and also genetic risk. Retinopathy you should all be familiar with because we've talked about this in diabetic patients. This is because poor blood sugar regulations leads to blood vessel changes, ischemia, and lesions. And here's a visual of diabetic retinopathy. Retinoblastoma is a malignant tumor of the retina that develops in the optic nerve. Retinitis pigmentosa is progressive degeneration of the rods. So this will affect primarily peripheral dim light vision as opposed to macular degeneration, which will affect central or color vision. Damage to the optic nerve. Glaucoma is acute or progressive, is caused by acute or progressive increase in intraocular pressure that damages the optic nerve. Papilledema is caused by an increase in intracranial pressure. So make sure you know the difference. Intraocular pressure is related to the aqueous humor, and that's that balance of production and reabsorption of that fluid. Papilledema caused by intracranial pressure is pressure from the brain or pressure with pressure within the cranium that can press on the optic nerve. This is critical and a sign of trauma. Optic neuritis is damage to the optic nerve, for example, by multiple sclerosis, infection, or autoimmune conditions. So blindness affects 1 in 28 Americans over the age of 40. And the major causes of blindness are macular degeneration, that's the loss of central vision at the fovea. This is primary genetic, but there may be some prevention possible. Cataracts are also a common cause of blindness. The lens will lose clarity and light will not be able to go through the lens. Luckily, cataract surgery is quite common and routine now. Glaucoma is caused by optic nerve damage due to intraocular pressure. This is preventable. Prevention is aimed at reduction of the intraocular pressure, which can be done with medication, laser, and even surgery. All right, I know this was a really quick review for you guys. Please let me know if you have any questions. Here are some of the references that we used.